Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship today at Good Shepherd. We're glad to have you here on this Memorial Day weekend. What a wonderful opportunity for us to worship the Lord, to have him come to us and and teach us his ways. And that's really what this new series is all about, a top-down faith. If you think about it, a lot of things in this world work from the from the bottom up. You want to build that base, and then you you work your way up, um, whether it's in school or career or things like that. When it comes to our faith, we have something that works differently. It's kind of reversed. Our God, through His Word and His sacraments, tells us what we should know, what we need to know about ourselves and about our faith and how we are to believe in him. And so that's a a wonderful thing for us to get us started with that lesson. We have uh, our first um, week of the series that only a triune God can do what a triune God can offer. Uh, So we talk about the Trinity today and what that means for us, who who we are and who our God is. Uh, Do we have a short little video for us that explains this top-down faith a little bit, and then after that, we'll jump into our opening hymn, Built on the Rock. May God bless us as we worship him. Have you ever thought about how some teachings of the Christian faith, many teachings of the Christian faith, seem unbelievable? Like they're just too good to be true? Grace? Salvation? Forgiveness? After all, Nothing's free, right? You can't just get something for nothing, right? But these earth-shattering truths about the Christian faith are so beautiful and so good that these teachings could not have possibly come from us humans. So God sent His Spirit from heaven to earth to empower His children to believe that which would otherwise be totally unbelievable a faith that could only possibly come from the top down.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First, what is confession? Confession has two parts. The one is that we confess our sins. The other, that we receive absolution or forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven. Second, what sins should we confess? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Third, how can we recognize these sins? Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, employer, or employee? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you hurt anyone by word or deed? Have you been dishonest, careless, wasteful, or done other wrong? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. Amen. Yeah. 
Fourth, how will the pastor assure a penitent sinner of forgiveness? He will say, by the authority of Christ, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal Spirit, and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, in mercy cleanse our hearts and lips, that free from doubt and fear we may ever worship you, one true immortal God, with your Son and the Holy Spirit living and reigning now and forever. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 6. Here the triune God delivers Isaiah from guilt and sin and offers Isaiah lofty purpose. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two, they covered their feet. With two, they flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of the one who called, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, I am doomed. I am ruined because I am a man with unclean lips, and I dwell among a people with unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, carrying a glowing coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with the coal and said, Look, this has touched your lips, so your guilt is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Ascribe to the Lord, you sons of God, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The voice of the Lord is heard over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders above the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord thunders in power. The voice of the Lord thunders in hands. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Mount Lebanon sit like a cow. Syrian sits like a cow. The voice of the Lord slashes with flashes of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of the earth. The voice of the Lord destroys the nations. The voice of the Lord shakes the earth. The voice of the Lord shakes the nations. So in his temple they all say, Glory! The Lord is seated over the flood. The Lord is seated as king forever. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 8. Here we see the triune God gives us the right to speak to our Father, the comfort of our brother, and the indwelling of the Spirit. This lesson also serves as the basis for our sermon. So then, brothers, we do not owe it to the sinful flesh to live in harmony with it. For if you live in harmony with the sinful flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. 
for you did not receive a spirit of slavery so that you are afraid again, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we all call out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Be Please stand in honor of the gospel. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Holy Gospel according to John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these miraculous signs you are doing unless God is with him. Jesus replied, Amen, amen, I tell you. Unless someone is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I tell you. Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whoever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whoever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be surprised when I tell you that you must be born from above. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is, this, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can these things be? asked Nicodemus. You are the teacher of Israel, Jesus answered, and you do not know these things? Amen, amen, I tell you. We speak what we know and we testify about what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. But I have told you earthly things, and yet you do not believe. How will you believe if I told you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Maybe seated, and all the children can come forward for a children's sermon. Hi, guys. You can sit on either side up here. Hi, it's okay. I'm not going to bite, I promise. Hi, guys. All right, I got a very, very simple question for you. Have you guys started learning math yet? Yes. Yeah, do you guys know I some math? Haven't. You haven't? Well, maybe we'll I, teach. I did. Oh, you did. Okay, okay. Well, we'll teach you some math today, okay? We're going to call it Jesus math, and it's going to be a little bit different than, than actual, like, arithmetic, okay? So in actual math, what is 1 plus 1 plus 1? 3, right? In Jesus math, it's a little bit different. 1 plus 2 plus 3. Not one plus two plus three. One plus one plus one. So one and one and one equals three. In Jesus' math, we have one plus one plus one equals one. That doesn't make any sense, does it? 
that's not how math normally works. Math is pretty upfront, pretty straightforward. You have certain rules. One plus one, if you have two of something, it's two. If you have three of something, it's three. So one plus one plus one equals one? That doesn't make any sense. Well, that's because today we're talking about something called the Holy Trinity. That is our God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How many people did I just talk about? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's three, right? But yet, there's only one God. So while there's three persons of the Godhead, there's only one God, and so one plus one plus one equals one in Jesus math. That's the best way that I can explain it. If I were to explain this to all the adults out there, I would use the same illustration because it's not something we can comprehend. We can't fully understand this majesty, this mystery of our triune God, but we believe it. Do you know why we believe it? Not because math says we believe it, but because the Bible says we believe it. When we open up our Bibles, God tells us what we need to know. It's what he says to us. It's a top-down thing for us in our lives. So sometimes the Bible says some really crazy things that are hard to believe, like God is three persons, yet he's only one God. But we believe it because the Bible says so. There's other crazy things the Bible talks about too, and that is this one right here, that Jesus, who is God, died for your sins so that you could have eternal life. Isn't that kind of silly that somebody died so you could live? Yeah, that's kind of silly. <laughs> However, that's exactly what the Bible tells us. Because Jesus died and because he rose and because he now lives again, we have eternal life. That's pretty crazy too. But it's the truth because it's what the Bible says. So let's fold our hands and let's pray and thank our God for all he's done for us. Dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for being our triune God who came into this world to save us from our sins. Please help us to always know and believe this in our heart of hearts that you are our good and gracious God who has given us eternal life. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can go get seated, and we'll continue with a hymn.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If someone were to ask you who you are, what would you tell them? Probably tell them your name. Maybe tell them where you're from, what you do for a living, that kind of stuff. Maybe you'd share some hobbies that you have, some different things that are unique to you that identify you. And shortly after that, you'd ask someone if they want to know who you are, who are, who are you? Like, I want to know who's asking who I am. Today in our lesson, we get to see who we really are in Christ, in our God, who came to live and die and then live again for us, who gave us eternal life. He, he gets to we get to share in this wonderful humanity or this um, salvation that he has given us because of his humanity in which he was also divine. See, our, our God, Jesus, became our brother. Our God, Jesus, who, who was our brother, traded his perfect life for our imperfect life so that we could have eternal life. He did that for us. And as he does that, and as the Holy Spirit works through his word to put faith into our hearts, to have us cry out to our God and call him Father, we see who we really are. We get to know what our identity is. So no longer do we identify ourselves by our name, like I'm, I'm Billy, I'm a pastor here at Good Shepherd, and I like to brew beer whenever I get a chance. That's, that's who, who I am. Just a little bit about me. However, when God calls me by the gospel and enlightens me by his gifts and sanctifies me in the one true faith, it changes who I am. Instead of first identifying myself by name, I'd say I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I'm somebody who is saved by my God. That is my identity. I am a child of of God, and, and that today is what we get to talk about. And we get to be confident in our identity of who we really are in Christ. But before we get to know who we really are, we want to know who our God really is. As I was explaining to the children, we have a triune God, and, and that's very fitting for all the different lessons that we talked about today to understand that our God in his nature makes us who we are in ours. Our God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and it doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. In any way we try to explain that away, to, to get his uh, identity known to us is treading on some heresy that really confines God in a certain way. And so we simply let the Trinity be the Trinity, that God is who he is, that yes, he's the Father, and the Father is not the Son, and that the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son, yet all three of these are God. That's the best way that we can explain it. That's the only way we can explain it without treading on some heresy that puts God into some modalistic monarchianism or some other weird word that I'm not going to explain up here on this Sunday. However, what God does teach us in his word is that God is a loving God. God is one who created this world not for himself, but, but for, for us. 
He, he loved this world, and then he sent his son into this world to save the world when they ruined it with their sins. That's who our God is. This loving God who made this beautiful, wonderful world for us, when we ruined it, stepped in to this ruined world to save us. So we have God the Father, and, and these things are kind of uh, just a, a simple way of looking at these three. But God the Father who created the world, then sends the Son into the world to save the world, and then the Holy Spirit comes um, after Pentecost and really is working throughout all of this, but really see his power at Pentecost, is poured out on us to tell us about what the Son and the Father both have done for us, to, to work through his word, to work through his sacraments, to cause us to believe in these wonderful truths of salvation. That's a little bit about who our God is. And as we learn about him more and more, we get to scratch just the surface of what that means for us. What that means for us is it changes from who we were to who we are. For many of us, it's hard to remember who we were apart from Christ because many of us were born into this world and then shortly after that we were baptized. And we don't remember that time apart from Christ so much, but, but we do know what Scripture teaches us about who we were and what that looks like. By every extent of the word, we were apart from God. We were sinners. We were separated from him. We were born into this world as sworn enemies of our God. And this sin we're talking about that filled our hearts, this, uh, this enmity in nature between us and God, really made it so that what we were was, was more than just bad, but through our actions and inclinations of our hearts, we were evil. That is what we were. We were evil. And, and I know you don't like to hear that. Nobody likes to think that. You go and you survey 10 people in this world and ask them what they think about themselves, and 9 out of 10 are going to say they're a pretty good person. They'll probably admit to some faults here and there, but they're not going to say that they're evil. You get one oddball in the group that might. But that is who we were. Apart from Christ, we are dead in our sins and transgressions. And this evil nature that is in our hearts separates us from our God. And that needed a change. And that's why God came into this, uh, came into this world to become our brother. So we've got Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, coming before us to take on humanity to be just like us. Except one big difference. When he's born into this world, he's born not from sin into sin, not from flesh to flesh, but he's born from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary so that he could be perfect. And as he's perfect, as the, as, as the God-man, only he has the perfect characteristics, the perfect recipe to be your Savior and mine. See, this is what everything clings upon, is that God created the world, and when his creation was ruined, he had this wonderful promise, this way from the very beginning, right after the very first sin, that he was going to send a Savior. Jesus was the Savior. Jesus came to live the life that you and I could never live. Jesus came and he died the death that we deserved. Jesus came and then he rose again from the dead to assure us that everything he set out to do of his mission of being our Savior was complete. That's why when he died on the cross, he could say it is finished. That is why when he rose from the dead, he could appear to everybody and say, peace be with you because I have conquered. That is why when he ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit then to assure us and to convince us that these things are true. God the Father created the world and 
So did the other two, but that's kind of how we, we put this out with these little, these little banners here, creator. And then we have the second person of the Trinity, the, the redeemer. And then we get to the third person of the Trinity, the, the sanctifier, who comes into our life and sanctifies us with the truth who testifies to us about the one true God. And some of these things, like I was telling the children before, are, are pretty hard to believe. Like God created the world in six regular 24-hour days by using just his word, or, or after he, he made things, he formed it like he did Adam from the dust of the ground. Or that... Jesus coming into the world could be our Savior. That, that one man who died saved the whole world from their sins. Oh, but also that this one man is also God at the same time. But not 50%, 50%, 100%, 100%. Some more Jesus math for you adults out there. And then we have the Holy Spirit who we can't really see, who comes and works through, through the words that he recorded through, through men, but it's really God's word to plant seeds of faith in our hearts, to have us actually believe that, yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I am evil by nature, but I have a God who changed all that and who changed my identity of who I now am. See, that's, that's who we were. We were apart from God. We were enemies of God. We were evil by nature. But God changed all that through his Son and through working of the Holy Spirit to make us who we now are. No longer sinners, but saints. Saints covered by the blood of Christ. That is our identity. And the way that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans is so beautiful for us says, indeed, those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. He doesn't make a mistake there when he says sons. Some translations may include sons and daughters, but really the original language says sons on purpose. Sons were the ones who received the inheritance. A little bit later, he's going to talk about inheritance, how we are all co-heirs with Christ. But this isn't a mistake, and this isn't an exclusive thing. This does not mean that women are not included just because it says sons. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Because everyone is called a son, everyone gets this wonderful inheritance. What is this inheritance? For you did not receive a spirit of slavery so that you are afraid, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom you call out Abba, Father, we received this wonderful identity that we have been adopted into Christ's family. This adoption is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing in this world when a, when a family wants to adopt someone to be part of their family. Usually in America, we think about adoption for a, a child, like an infant or a, a young person. But in other countries... Um, like in Japan, they might have different ways that they adopt and they have uh, taken on this initiative where they actually adopt like adults even as well. And so adults can run the family company or be part of them and they, they ensue all of the different things that have come through that family name, even though they're adults and not adopted as children. You've been adopted whether you were adopted when you were a child or an adult, whenever you came to faith, God placed his name on you and said, you are my child. Think about how that resonates in your life of who you now are. Before a sworn enemy of God, before uh, my identity was to be in league with Satan, to be evil, to only know the wrong and the bad in this world, but God changed that for us. Our triune God steps into our life and changes that and says, you are no longer that. That is what you were, but who you are is my child. And any child can go to their parents for anything. Well, in this sin-sick world, it's hard to know that because sometimes parents aren't always the perfect parents that we try to be. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we're not always there. 
But in this relationship between you and your heavenly father, you can always go to your father and he will always be there. Never once has he missed a step. Never once has he not been there for you. He's always been there just waiting, opening his arms, looking for you to come to him where he can wrap you up in a robe of his righteousness and say, I love you, my dear child. You are mine. I've made you my son. I've made you a co-heir with Christ. And that is who you are. That is your identity, and that is what we can be confident in. The Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. And now, if we are children, we are also heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. My dear fellow children of God, my, my dear siblings in Christ, we have a God who became like us to be our brother. We have a God who changed who we are so that our identity could be labeled as not just by our name and what we do for a living or some of our hobbies, but instead so that our identi identity could be wrapped up in who he is. When we identify to the world that we are Christians, we are saying that we are followers of our God, that we believe in who he is and what he's done and who he has made us. That is who you are, and you can be confident in that. So now when you leave from here today and you go on into the world and enjoy the rest of your Memorial Day weekend here, and somebody asks you and you meet somebody new, says, who, who are you and what's your name? Well, be polite and tell them who you are and what your name is. But you could also tell them a little bit about who you really are as a Christian. Don't shy away from it. Don't, don't miss out on the opportunity to witness your faith. Instead, be confident in your identity. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may it guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Having heard the word of the Lord, we now confess our faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. may be seated and we continue with the prayer of the church for the prayer this morning we have a few special intercessions uh, first of all we pray for for two sons of the congregation who have been given different calls uh, alex dimke um, who used to uh, his parents used to be a member here a little bit ago um, got a call to serve as a vicar in anchorage alaska and then we also have hugo agalde beamer who was called to be a pastor in uh, teresa wisconsin and so we want to keep both of them in our prayers. Uh, we also want to keep uh, our member, Rich Patterson, in our prayers. He is going under um, a, a heart procedure uh, on Tuesday, and uh, we want to make sure that God be with him and take care of him. Um, I couldn't remember the exact word that he told me to say, so I said procedure. I apologize for that. Um, but we, we pray that God would be um, there guiding him in those doing the operation um, and, and being with you through all of that. We pray. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. 
Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body and mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and the dying. Dear Lord, we also ask that you'd especially be with our dear brother in Christ, Rich Patterson, as he undergoes this uh, heart procedure. We pray that you would be with him and give him comfort in knowing that you are a loving God who has taken away all sins, that you have loved the world in this way. And so if you've loved the world with this capacity and knowing that Rich is a part of this world, you have loved him to that extent as well. We pray that you would guide these physicians to take care of all the different um, things that they have to take care of in this operation and pray that everything goes smoothly and that he have a swift recovery. We also pray for those whom you have called to serve you, first of all, for for Alex Demke, who will be serving his vicar here in Alaska. We pray that you would guide him and, and lead him and instruct him so that he may learn the ways of being a minister and may grow in his understanding of how to proclaim your love to all. We also pray for Hugo, who is now going to be a pastor at St. Peter and Zion in Teresa, Wisconsin. We pray that he will be nothing but a blessing to all of those whom he serves. We pray that you go with him and have him minister to those just as you have ministered to him. And finally, dear Lord, we ask that you would hear us as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. At this time, we will collect the offering. We please ask that you also use this opportunity to fill out a connection card, whether the paper copy or digital. Um, we love to know who's worshiping with us, and if there's any way that we can pray for you, uh, let us know as well. Um, so that we can minister to you in that way.
we sing our next hymn. Please stand as we close with prayer. 
Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated and we sing our final hymn. Good morning once again. Glad to have you with us in worship. A special welcome to any guests we have. We, we do love having you here. A few announcements for you on pages 18 and 19 of your worship folder that I'd like to highlight. Um, first of all, we have our basketball camp coming up in June from the 20th to the 22nd, and volunteers are needed. If you're interested in that, know that these are just very little ones three to six-year-olds, so you don't need to be a professional basketball player, um, but you do need to know some basics about basketball. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can give um, either um, me or Nick Pamperin a call and let us know. Also, um, if you want to take a poster or two, um, which are in the back, and hang them up, um, at your work or just take them to another place or something like that, that would be great as well. Posters are available in the back of church. Um, the church directory should be coming out soon. If you haven't submitted a picture, please do so. We'd really like to get those pictures or else it's going to go out without pictures and um, you're going to see your name without anything picture there and, and we'd, we'd like to get the pictures as well. Um, this golf group is starting up in June here. Um, the Lutheran Libations League is going to have uh, another event on Friday, May 31st at 6.30. That'll be over here at the Parsonage. We are going to have a bonfire, um, so bring some games to play or um, a tire to wear, a chair to bring, some beverages, whatever you want, um, some snacks, and we'll just hang out and, and have some fun um, enjoying each other's company. Um, but remember that if you do come, if you're a member who comes, you have to invite somebody else to come who isn't a, who isn't a member. Um, the Lunch Bunch is meeting Wednesday at June 19th at 11 a.m. They're meeting at Daisy's Garage. And then those two conferences for the Wells Women Conference and the National Conference on Worship, Music, and the Arts are both open as well. Uh, other than that, you can read whatever's left there or the details I didn't provide. Um, we will be having fellowship downstairs and then a Bible study. We'll be continuing with Jonah 
Um, and so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Jonah and that great big fish or whale that ate him, um, we'll be talking more about that, zeroing in on his prayer today as well. So please do join us for fellowship and Bible study. Other than that, are there any other announcements that need to be made? All right. May God bless your week. Thank you.